1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll begin reading with verse number 13. Paul, writing under the inspiration and the guidance and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, and with the shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, then we, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What a comfort. We're going to go be with Jesus. Now I want to minister for a few minutes the subject, the doctrine of the rapture of the church. The doctrine of the rapture of the church. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the presence of the Lord that we have sensed, that we have felt. I ask for your anointing. Anoint me to minister. Anoint me to speak that which I believe you have placed into my heart for a time such as this. Take the word to the hearts of your people and may it be a blessing and may it instruct, may it encourage your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that in the last three years our nation is on a downward spiral. I mean, in the last three years... We have seen our nation fall to a level that I never thought that I would see. Crime running rampant in the streets. The economy being what it was. I don't know about you, but I saw, I don't know if you saw this or not, but just a few days ago in New York City, I saw the video where two police officers in Times Square trying to move a crowd alone, a group of illegal immigrants jumped them and beat them. And, of course, they were arrested only to be let go. Immediately let go. No respect. You know, it's one thing for criminals to have no respect for the law. But when the district attorney's office has no respect for the law, it's bad. And when they were released, going to get on a bus to go to California, yeah, that we paid for their trip, one of them was filmed, I know I'm not going to give, but he gave very vulgar hand gestures. You know, uh, how many of you ever been to New York City? Well, if you're like me, I, every time I go, I go to the Statue of Liberty. I've been there many times. And you know I'm not going to read or quote the, the poem that is engraved, but except one part. That famous saying, the Lady Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. Now, I believe that. However... Lady Liberty did not say, give us your thugs. Give us your gangbangers. Give us your carjackers. Give us your rapists. Give us your murderers. Give us your freeloaders. Give us your drug dealers. Didn't say that. But that's what happens when you have no respect for the law, no boundaries. You're not a nation without borders. 
And we, we're in a, a, a spiral with, with, we're being invaded by drugs. We're being invaded by terrorists. I mean, you read the reports of the Border Patrol. They're saying, we're seeing military age young men, not from South America, but from Asia and the Middle East coming across the border. And then you see what's happening in the cities. When there's no respect, for, it's a downward spiral. Uh, you, now, we're, you know, we, we've got an administration and leaders that say abortion is health care. Now think of that. Murder is health care. Abortion is health care. Well, if abortion is health care, then slavery is job creation. You see, that took you back, didn't it? That hits you right between the eyes. That's how stupid, that's how crazy this world that we're living in has become. I read an article just the other day written by a doctor, not a Christian, had nothing to do with God. But the title of the article was Transgenderism, the New Gnosticism. Now that is, it came out of Greek mythology, that is also a spiritual term. Gnosticism, that's what Paul would deal with in the early church. The Gnostics were those who claimed a higher revelation. They claimed that they were on a superior level, that they had revelation that you couldn't get from the Bible. And it was seeping into the church. And this secular doctor... Having writing nothing about God, not trying to bring spirituality in it, but the gist of the article was this. He said, the med our medical practitioners, the medical profession has been so polluted and so corrupted by pushing transgenderism. And the gist of the article was, listen, it's not, she said, it's not just some messed up people whose minds are confused, but she said, the purveyors of it are our doctors. Our doctors who have sworn the Hippocratic Oath to do the patient no harm and yet they have no problem butchering little boys and little girls. He called it the new Gnosticism, the downward spiral. Climate change. What a joke. What a joke. It is the biggest financial ripoff that the world has ever seen. The world, is, do you realize in the last 35 years, there has been 47 pronouncements of doom with dates attached to it concerning climate change. And guess what? We're still here. We're still here. Oh, the, the, the rivers are going to rise. The ocean is going to rise. And we've got former presidents, so the, war, the oceans are rising and yet they're buying homes with beachfront property. Because they know the American public are too stupid to recognize we're being sold a bill of goods. Now, I, I believe the climate changes. It's called summer, fall, winter, spring. And I do believe that we go through periods where it's colder and it's warmer. But God did that. That's God working to regulate the ecosystem. And oh, we're, we're, man is the cause of all of this. And so we're going to go to Davos and thousands of rich billionaires who want to take our money and make us walk. While they fly their private jets. Polluting the... E <laughs> The very ones telling us how to live are the biggest polluters. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it's in three years. It's like it's magnified. It's like every day you don't want to turn on the television because there's some more stupidity going. But I didn't come this morning to talk about the stupidity. And I didn't come this morning to talk about crime, even though I mentioned That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to tell you, the greatest day that we have ever seen is soon and very soon to come upon us. 
It's called the rapture of the church. Hallelujah. Church, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to shake off the dust of this earth. I'm listening with my ears for the trump of God to sound at any moment. The rapture of the church. Hallelujah. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a made-up story. It's real. It's the Bible. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's going to get bad. It's going to get a little bit worse. Don't mark my word. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. Now, who's in the White House can stem and hold back the tide. But our Bible tells us we see in the war in Ukraine, the war in Israel, we've got genocide going on right now in South Sudan with thousands of Africans dying of starvation, being murdered because of ethnic cleansing, tribal. We, we, we've got our nation is divided black and white. Never before has there been a greater division among our ethnicities of this nation than right now. And it's all done on purpose to divide the races. But let me tell you, I, I'm not Martin Luther King, obviously, but I still believe what the man said. When he said, and on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, that fateful day in the 60s when he stood there and said, I believe the day is coming when, when we will not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. And as a child of God, when I look at somebody, I don't see a white face, a brown face, a red face, a yellow face, a black face. All I see is, are they washed in the blood? And if they're washed in the blood, they are my brother. They are my sister. I am to treat them right. I am to treat them with respect. I am to honor the Jesus Christ that is in their heart and in their life. As it was said long ago, the color line was dissolved at Calvary. Yeah, so it's bad. But in spite of the Bible told us all of these things was going to happen. But in the work of God and the Word of God, God always saves the best for last. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to tell you how this whole thing is going to end. I'm going to tell you right now. First... There is coming a move of God. I believe it with every fiber of my being. I'm not just saying that for applause. I'm not just saying that for effect. But I believe and I stand on the authority of the word of Almighty God. In the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And upon your servants and your handmaidens will I pour out of my spirit. And they will prophesy. So the move of God is coming. And then the trump of God is going to sound. And I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Now, if you notice in the title of my message, I specifically use the word doctrine. Doctrine in the last 35 years, that word, in too many charismatic and Pentecostal circles, has become a negative word. I mean, I've heard them on television, I've read it in articles. We don't need doctrine. Doctrine divides us. No, that's not true. The Word of God divides us. And we're not to have fellowship with those whose view of the Scripture is skewed and wrong. Hello? But doctrine is a good word. I hope you're taking notes. Let me just define what doctrine is. And this comes from a gentleman that has long ago gone to be with the Lord. 
one of Pentecost's earliest Bible scholars. His name was Meyer Perlman. And in his book, Knowing the Doctrines of the Bible, he said this. He said, doctrine is just nothing more than the fundamental truths of the Bible arranged in systematic form. He then said, doctrine is God's revelation of truth as found in Scripture. In other words, God gave us his doctrine. It's called the Bible. This is the story of Jesus Christ. It tells us who we are. It tells us how we came into Christ. It tells us how to live on this journey. It tells us what the end result is going to be. And it tells us our reward that we have to look forward to. And God used men of old, Bible scholars who've come, they're now passed on with the Lord, but he gave them insight into Scripture. And then they took the great truths of the Bible and they begin to put it into a form of a word that we call doctrine so that we can now break the Bible apart and understand. And so they scream, we don't need doctrine. But let me, let me just make this statement. You can't get saved without the doctrine of salvation being presented to you. The sick cannot be healed until the doctrine of divine healing is presented to them so that faith can begin to grow and faith can be exercised. Believers cannot get baptized in the Holy Spirit without the doctrine of the infilling of the Holy Spirit being preached to them. And the rapture of the church is one of the foundational doctrines of the Bible. Now, the Bible being a book of doctrine, there are things that are doctrine, but we look at them in a peripheral manner. In other words, they're not tied to salvation, but they're truth. But then there are the cardinal doctrines. These are the things that cannot, there is no debate on it. We're not going to argue over it. It's what the Bible says and we believe. And I'll just throw out some of them. So one is the inerrancy of Scripture. This is the Word of God. It came about as the Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of men of old, as Peter told us, and gave them illumination, gave them inspiration, and anointed them to write what the Spirit of God wanted them to write. That's a cardinal doctrine. The virgin birth of Christ is a cardinal doctrine. There can be no debate on that. God became man. You know, I heard a beautiful testimony when I was in Springfield. Of, uh, and it was a missionary dealing with Muslims. And this particular man practicing Muslim, but in his heart after going through all of the rigmarole they go through, praying to Allah, reading the Quran, he was empty. And he said... If, if Allah is real, I want him to reveal himself. If the Quran is real, I want him to reveal himself. About three or four nights later, the missionary told me he was in bed asleep. And all of a sudden, the room lit up. He awakened and there stood a figure over him. And he said, I wasn't afraid. I said, who are you? And he said, well, you've asked for God. And he's not Allah. To reveal himself. The one you hate, that's who I am. And I'm revealing myself to you. And he said, you're Jesus. He said, yes. And then he left. And he got a Bible. Began to study the Word of God. But there were some questions. In his own mind, he, he didn't have a preacher or a church he could go to. 
But in his mind, there was a question that he could not wrap his head around. And he had it backwards. He, he, he cried out one day. He said, God, I don't understand something. How can man become God? That night he went to sleep and he awoke once again, the light permeating the room. And he said, Jesus stood before him and said, the question is wrong. You've asked how man can become God. They can't. The question is, God became man. Oh. And this missionary tell me, said, when he... When that appearance of the Lord, when he spoke those words, the man told him later, I got it. I got it. I had it backwards. I was looking at it wrong. God stepped out of eternity and into time and 2,000 years ago was born of a virgin all for the express purpose to save man. That's a cardinal doctrine. There is no debate on that. There's no debate on the triune Godhead. I know we've got some that, well, I won't spend any time on that. The deity of the Lord Jesus, His miracles, His death, His burial, His resurrection, those are all cardinal doctrines because they tie in with salvation. The Holy Spirit is important. The baptism, I'm Pentecostal. I thank God I speak in tongues. But speaking in tongues is not salvation. Now understand that. You speaking in tongues is not what saves you. It is your faith and His grace in Jesus Christ, who He is and what He did at Calvary. So while the Holy Spirit is important, speaking in tongues is important. I cannot put it on the same level as Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. But I believe that end time Bible prophecy, especially the rapture of the church, is a cardinal doctrine. And I'll explain why that I put it. Because the rapture of the church. Well, remember, you remember the story of the two that were translated, Enoch and Elijah, right? God took them. They, never, they did not die. They're still alive today. Now, I know that we have some in Bible prophecy, they try to say that when the two witnesses come, that one will be Moses and one will be Enoch. That's wrong. No, it's Elijah and Enoch. And I'll prove it to you. Moses has died already. The Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die. And we know the three witnesses at the end of their prophecy have prophesied for three and a half years. Then and then, only then will the Antichrist be able to kill them. You cannot kill the soul and spirit. Hello. So it's not Moses is one of the two witnesses. No, it's Enoch and Elijah. The Bible said they were what? Translated. That's just another term for raptured. That's just another term for resurrection. They're, they're, they're being translated was to give us a foretaste of the translation that is to come of the body of Christ. Somebody needs to shout. Uh, now, we believe in the rapture of the church. Now, 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 let's look at what is the purpose of the rapture. We get this question on mother's program. And really, this is why I'm preaching this message. We get more questions about the end times. What is the purpose of the rapture of the church? It is to raise the righteous dead in order to give them a glorified body. Hello? They'll go first. And then we, who have not tasted death yet, will be translated, will be raptured out, will be resurrected out of here, all to be with the Lord in order to receive a glorified body. Now, I will tell you what a glorified body is. No sickness. No death. 
Somebody needs to shout. You're not going to be overweight. You're not going to have back problems. You're not going to need your glasses. Ladies, you won't need Max Factor. Hello, hello. We're going to we're going to become and it, we're going to be perfect. Oh, hallelujah! There's not going to be any blemish. There won't be any scar. There won't be any problem. We will be like Him. Hallelujah! That's the purpose. To bring us out of the grave and to bring us out of this world. That's the reason why I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care how bad the world is getting. I don't care how bad that sin is abounding. I'm getting ready to leave this world. I'm about ready to take a trip on the good old gospel ship. Now, there are four views of the rapture. The first one is not a prevalent view, but it's bigger than people realize. And that is, there is an element in the church who deny the rapture completely. They deny the millennial reign. They deny all of that. I'm not going to spend any time except to, on that except to say this. You can't be that ignorant. You can't read the Bible and come up with that. <laughs> Am I plain enough? That's ignorance. That is ignorance of the highest order. And, and here's what makes it so bad. You really cannot be born again and deny the rapture. Because to deny the rapture is to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the resurrection of Christ was the earnest, the first fruits, the down payment of a rapture to come. Oh, hallelujah. And so I'm just going to say it right now. I don't care who you are. I don't care how big your following is on Facebook. And I don't care that you call yourself prophet, apostle, bishop, elder, dumbo, it, whatever. I don't care. You can come up with all the titles you want. If you're teaching that, I'm just going to outright say it. You cannot be saved and deny the rapture of the church. Because that is, let me say it again, that is to deny the resurrection on the third day. That stone was rolled away. And our Lord and Savior stepped out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And it is a picture, oh hallelujah, of the resurrection that awaits the church. The second group is what we call pre-tribulation rapture. We believe this church, this ministry, the network... We subscribe to a pre-tribulation rapture. We, meaning this, that we do not believe that the church will have to go through any of the great tribulation. Now, I'm going to say more about that in a second, but I want to give the others. But then there's a second group, and they're pretty big. They believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, meaning that the church will have to go through three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. And then there are those who preach and proclaim and teach what is called a post-tribulation rapture, which means that the church must go through the entirety of the seven years of the Great Tribulation. Now, we don't believe that. However, it's not worth arguing with them, those people. Because here, understand something. All three groups, pre, mid, and post, we all agree on the event. Hello. We don't agree on the timing. And that's real simple. Don't argue over it. When it happens, we're going to know. Hello. If, it's, if, if, if the truth is a pre-tribulation rapture, you're going to know it. If it's a mid-tribulation, you're going to know it. 
If it's a post trivia, you're going to know it. But the key is, we are all we believe that we're leaving here. Hallelujah. But the reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is no one has been able who practice or preaches mid and post. They've never really been able to give, in my opinion, a logical, biblical explanation is why. I heard one, one I got a long email and from a preacher and he's telling me all this and, and the, his summation was that the church must go through the tribulation, at least some part of it, to be purified. And I, 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 I thought to myself, if the blood of God's Son doesn't purify, what does? Secondly, if it is the events that are, are going to take place on this earth that purifies, where does that leave all the saints who have died and gone on to be? Are they semi-pure? Are there 47 and a third percent pure? No, no. It's the blood of God's Son that purifies the child of God. Hallelujah. When you got saved, the blood of God's Son washed you and cleansed you from all sin and all unrighteousness. And the moment you accepted Him, you became a child of God and you are holy and you are you're as holy as you'll ever be and as righteous as you'll ever be. So, but we believe as a church in a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you as a pastor. That's our view. And don't come in here and try to teach something else. If you believe in a mid or a post, that's fine. I'm not going to argue with you. But you leave it out there. Hello? I'm in charge. These men are in charge. We can read the Bible for ourselves. The Holy Spirit speaks to every man that's on that platform. And we can rightly divide the word of truth. And it is up to us as the under shepherds under the shepherd Jesus Christ to stand and proclaim what we believe is the truth. So if you, whatever you want to believe about that, you can believe it out there. Not going to argue with you. Not going to think any different of you. But it don't come in the door. You leave it in your car. And if you don't, we'll have a come to Jesus meeting. Hello? Because we are responsible. All right. Then, why do we believe it's Bible doctrine? I, I should have done this beginning because verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. That makes it Bible doctrine. Now, let's look at this. I, 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 I don't have a lot of time. It said, the Lord shall descend from heaven. And we will meet the Lord in the air. I want to look at that word, air. Uh, there are two Greek words meaning air, A-I-R. And they're different. The first is spelled A-E-R. And it refers to the lower dense density of this planet. Now I'll explain it more uh, in a moment how, what that means. And the second word is either, A-I-T-H-E-R. I probably didn't pronounce it right, but you cannot pronounce it either yourself, so my version is just as good as yours. And the Greeks of that day, they would stand at the summit of Mount Olympus. And everything from below Mount Olympus, when they described it, they used the word A-E-R, air. And everything above Mount Olympus, the atmosphere above, they used the word ether. Mount Olympus is 6,400 feet tall. So that gives us a pretty good idea. And Paul used those words here. That gives us a pretty good idea. At the rapture of the church, the Lord's not going to set foot on this earth at that time. He's going to set foot. He's going to come to about 6,500, 7,000 feet in the air. And we're going to go up to meet Him. But at the second coming, we're coming back with Him. Oh, hallelujah. And He will come and set up His kingdom upon this earth. Oh, 
The word rapture, and I'm, I, this is not in depth, I'm just giving you some, some overall thing. The word rapture is not in this Bible. That's another, you know, they argue something like, well, the rapture, that word's not even in the Bible. It's like somebody, a oneness fella, came to one of my services. And uh, oneness are, are, are they've got some wonderful people, but their doctrine is wrong. They don't believe in the Trinity. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Father. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and they believe that Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. And that's wrong. That's just wrong. And if you get the Godhead wrong, you can't interpret the Bible correctly. Now, I understand that. But they're good. They've got wonderful people, got good music, and they got some good preachers. They got some mean people, too. They'll, 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 they'll shuck your corn real quick. And, uh, but anyway, he came up to me, and you know, they love to argue. And he came up to me in a service just for the express purpose to argue. And his big thing was, and he started arguing with me on some stuff, and he said, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. I said, yeah, that's right, it's not. But I said, let me ask you a question. Long before anybody ever sat down and got insight, let's just, I said, let's take it out of the Bible. Let's take it into the stars. I said, do you believe that Saturn and Pluto and the Milky Way always existed before somebody sat down and gave it a name? Uh, yeah. I said, yes, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but what that word represents is in the Bible. And Bible scholars of time past sat down and God gave them revelation and illumination and helped them to put this together. And to, they looked at the Godhead and they said, there is one God manifested three ways. One God manifested through God the Father, God the, the Trinity. He never, he didn't, he just turned around and walked away. But the word rapture, though, though it's not found, that word rapture is not found in the Bible. It is derived from the two words caught up. And it is in the Greek, the word harpezo. And actually the Greek word harpezo is where we get our English term rapture. And as it's used, as it was used then, there, that way, it, it, it speaks of rapture in the, the sense of great joy. When, when those Greeks would get excited, when, when there was great things happening, joy, they would harpezo. They would be enraptured with the event that was going on. And the Holy Spirit used that word. And here's, but it has four meanings. First of all, it means, this word harpezo, Four meanings, it means, number one, to carry off by force. And the idea is this, that when that trump sounds, and we get ready to leave this earth, and we're leaving this earth, we cannot see it with our eyes, with the human eye. But if you could see through the eye of the Spirit, you would see demon spirits that populate this planet. Demon spirits everywhere with the express purpose to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And when that trump sounds, those demon spirits will do everything in their power to hinder the church from leaving this planet. But I got news for you. He is greater than all the powers of darkness and every demon spirit. And he will bring us out by force. Hallelujah. Then it means... Um, this is where we, this is really, the, the second meaning is really where, why we stand as strongly as we do in a pre-tribulation rapture. It means to rescue from the danger of destruction. What is the danger of destruction? The great tribulation. But he's going to rescue us. You are his child. He loves you. 
And he's waiting and anticipating that moment in time that they, the Godhead already knows when the rapture is going to take place. We may not know when it is. We live our life every day as it can happen every day. But the Godhead knows when that day and time is. And he's going to bring us out so that we will not have to endure one second of that tyrant called the Antichrist. Somebody needs to shout on that. He loves you that much. Then it means to claim for oneself eagerly. That speaks of the love of God for you. He eagerly awaits that moment that he will bring his children together into the kingdom from every tribe, every nation. Now, can you imagine this? Can you imagine at that point in time here in America, some of you may be, you ladies, you're going to be in the grocery store in line to pay for those groceries. And all of a sudden you're going to hear something and you're going to be gone. You, you men, you're on the job. You may be working construction. And you may be in mid-swing of that jet, and all of a sudden, you're gone. You students, you may be getting ready to take an exam you didn't study for. <laughs> you blew it off. And you're going to walk in there and sit down and open up that book, get ready to write down, and all of a sudden, you're going to hear the trump of God. But not just here. In the islands of the sea. Oh, hallelujah. Deepest, darkest Africa. In the bush. I I, I don't know. I know the, the, the world's largest refugee camp, which was in Somalia or the Sudan, one of the two. It's still there today. There's still over 80,000 refugees there today. If it wasn't for the United Nations, for, for the, 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 the largest of the nations of the world through relief programs through the United Nations, they would die. And I don't know how many of them are saved. Some of them are. But in the midst of a refugee camp, when that trump sounds, they're leaving. In, 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 in the midst of war, bullets flying when the trumpet sounds. They're leaving. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Black, white, red, brown, yellow. Some of them speaks English. Some of them don't. Some of them speaks German. Some of them speak Swahili. Some will speak French. But we're all going. Can you? All at one time. Think about that. Because the Lord is calling us home. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, I got to tell you this. this, this Describe how much the Lord loves you. This popped into my head. That's dangerous sometimes. I was in Australia a few years ago preaching. And a man came up to me after the service. He said, I'm a missionary evangelist. I travel to the islands of the sea in the South Pacific. He said, I, I, I really try to deal with people who, people groups who have never really heard the gospel. And he said, I heard in a particular island a few hours away from Australia by air that there was a group of people that had never heard the gospel. He said, I, I called people that I knew that knew pastors that were on the other side of the island and they confirmed we can't get there it, it, it's, it's too hard and as far as we know they've never heard the gospel and he was one of these you know these, these, these adventurous type I'm going to take the gospel I'm going to be the first man to get to these people and preach the gospel he said I flew from Australia it took, took several hours landed spent the night the next day, we get into the, with, uh, with another missionary and a couple of pastors. 
He said, we got in a Land Rover. We drove, and he said the island was huge. We drove until there were no more roads. And they had arranged for some people to meet us with mules. Then we got on the mules. We traveled more hours, had to spend the night out in the jungle. Got up the next morning, rode the mules until we had to go up. The mules couldn't go, and we had to walk then. And he said, they told me, he said, when we get to the top of this summit, we're going to start going down and we're going to round a bend and you're going to find that village. And he was, he, he was telling me, he said, man, in my heart I was doing cartwheels. Ooh, I get to preach the gospel. I'm the first man to ever give them the name Jesus uh, and to preach the truth to them. Oh, God, save people. He was, man, he was praying and, man, he was believing God. I'm going to be the first and he said, they made the summit. They start going down. They saw that bend, and the guy said, we're about ready. We're almost there. And he said, all of a sudden, I heard in the distance coming from that village music. Couldn't make out what it was, but it was music. And then he said, as I got a little closer, I said, no, it can't be. It was, he heard the song, there is a river. And he said, then I recognized the voice. It was Jimmy Swaggart. And he said, he said, I got into that village. And he said, I looked over and there was an old beat up boom box that had a cassette player hooked up to a generator playing for the whole village to hear. And he said, there is Brother Swaggart singing. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the hearts with singing could I have some help come on singers musicians get out here hallelujah get up here quickly not 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 the next century you young guys got legs to move and and he said he said I could just sense the presence of, he said chill bumps broke out over my arms chill bumps on the back of my neck and he said I, I walked in and all of a sudden, I was surrounded by people, those villagers. He said, a man walked in. They didn't call him chiefs. They called him elder. He was the elder. And he said, I didn't have a chance to introduce myself to him. I walked up to him, and he walked up to me and spoke their dialect, and it was translated. This is what he asked. What he, I mean, what he said to that mission. He said, did Jimmy send you? Did Jimmy send you? I'm telling the truth. God hears what I'm saying. And he, could, he said, before he answered, he said, well, 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 well how, how, how did you get this? He said, well, twice a year, there's a, a trader. I don't even think it's from Australia. I think from New Zealand. A couple times a year, he would pass through and sell trinkets and trade things. And he said, he had this cassette tape. And he was listening to it. And the elder said, I felt something. Come on, give us, give us that first verse. Give us that first verse. Somebody, come on. Come on. This is what he heard. As a rushing mighty wind. As a rushing mighty wind. It filled. It filled their heart with singing and gave them peace. Yet it gave them peace within. The prophets gave the promise. Well, the prophet gave his promise. The Spirit shall descend. Let the Spirit shine Oh, hallelujah. And if you drink this water, yet if you drink this water, 
You'll never thirst again. Why? Because there's a river. Sing it with me right now, real quick, before I finish my story. said did Jimmy send you and this missionary was pretty smart he said well I know brother Swaggart he didn't mean personally but I know brother Swaggart and he said well brother Swaggart had the one the song is about send me and I'm going to explain to you what the river is and he said that elder st stopped everything and told everybody in the village they had to come because the elder said. And he said, I stood there and I got to preach the message of Christ and Him crucified. And I began to explain He was that river. He's the water that brings life. And he said, I gave an altar call. And he said, Brother Donnie, I don't know how many really got saved, but he said, every person in that village raise their hand now listen to me church I don't know where that village is but when that trump sounds when that trump sounds those souls are leaving here they're going to be eagerly transported into the hands of the Lord then it said to snatch out in a way that's the final meaning to snatch out in a way meaning it will happen so suddenly in the blink of an eye. Now let me close with this. What are the requirements to be in the rapture? What is? What will guarantee you? You. Me. From being in that rapture. One thing. It's, let me tell you what it's not. It's not the membership in your church. It's not belonging to Family Worship Center. It's not being a media church member. It's not being a viewer of SBN or going to the Assemblies of God or the Church of God or the Baptist. It's not how much money you put in. It's not how many good works you do. There's only one thing that guarantees inclusion into the rapture and that is to be in Christ that's it in Christ born again every head bowed every eye closed no one looking around I don't know you in this building I mean I know you but I don't know all of you and I don't know the condition of your heart and I would pray that every person in this building is a child of God. I'll get to television in just a moment. I pray that you've made peace with God. But in my spirit, I feel there's some here this morning. You've, you've been playing church. You've got all the signs of someone that's religious, but really in your heart, 
there's no spirituality. You don't really know Jesus. And I'm not here to embarrass a single person. But if you would raise your hand right where you are, I won't embarrass you. But if you'd pray, raise that hand and say, Brother Donnie, I need to make sure my life is right. I need to make sure my heart is right. There's a hand right there. Thank you, sir. Anyone else quickly? That would There's a hand right there. Thank you. Christians, start praying. God, move across this building. There's a hand, young man. Thank you. Anyone else that would raise that hand? I need prayer this morning. Pastors, I want you to come and stand down front. And as they begin to sing, I'm going to ask those of you that raise that hand to step out from where you are and come stand right here and let us pray with you. Come on, as they begin to sing. Sing, there's a river again. Come on, if you raise that hand over here, over here, right here. Ma'am, come on. Come on, sir. Come on, young man. Come on, young man. Hallelujah. By television. Are you saved? Have you surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ? Are you ready? cup of God. Are you ready for the rapture? Is everything right? If it's not, I'm going to pray just as I'm praying with them. I'm going to pray with you. Come on, sing it with them. playing softly in the background whether you're standing here in family worship center or you're in your house you're in your den you're in your living room you're in your kitchen you're in your apartment you may even be in your car driving down the road but you know that your heart's not right you know there are things that you haven't surrendered to the Lord. The first thing I want to tell you, and it's the most important thing, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done, the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. The God of the universe, the creator of time, loves you. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. I'm even going to ask you to raise your hands as a sign of surrender and submission. And I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. And I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Understanding it's not saying words that saves you. It's if you believe it. It's called faith. By television, believe these words. I'll even ask everyone in the building to say it with them. So their voices will not be alone. Now lift your hands right now. Those of you in the audience, stretch your hands toward them. Now let's say it right now. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, come to you I come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm a sinner, but I believe you are the Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ shed His blood on Calvary's cross. And I believe on the third day He rose from the dead. And because He lives, I can live also. Right now, I surrender my past, my present, and my future to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And right now, I can say, I'm saved. I'm born again. I am 
a child of God. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Every one of you by television that prayed that prayer. We have a book that we want to give you free of charge. What must I do to be saved? All you got to do is call us, write us, email us. We'll send this book. It has some information that you need to have on getting started in your walk with the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock for Pastor Sean as he ministers for us tonight. Come on. Oh, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done.